Hi, this is Glenn McQuaid. And I'm Larry Fezenden. And you are listening to... Tales from Beyond the Pale. The podcast. Greetings, audiophiles, and welcome to a very special episode of Tales from Beyond the Pale. Today, we are celebrating 10 years bringing you tales. Our very first episode premiered on October 26, 2010. Now, look at us. <laughs> uh, 50 tales later. Is it 50, Glenn? Um, I think if it's not 50, it's 49. Well, there you have it. Uh, now we're giving them away for free on our podcast. We are, but I have to say, um, we shouldn't be too bitter about giving them away for free because I feel like I can hear the bitterness in your voice as you carved that pumpkin, Larry. Um, no, it's been great. The podcast has been fantastic. I think we've gotten the audio dramas out to a ton of new people and we've made a bunch of new friends. Yes. Uh, speaking of friends, let's um, let's invite some of our old pals. Maybe they can reminisce with us. Uh, we've got some people gathered. I hope you're all carving pumpkins. You can pretend. To be Who have we got? Who have we got here? Well, let's see. I see. Uh, I see Clay McLeod Chapman is in the house. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Happy Halloween. Happy Halla Quarantine. <laughs> you How are you, man? It's good to hear your voice. I know. Uh, that's all you get. Uh, you know, I'm, we're speaking from the, the bunker here in Brooklyn. Yeah. Uh, similarly, uh, from the bunker here in Ireland, yeah. where we've just gone into another six-week lockdown. Oh, my God. This will be the last time you hear or see any of us because uh, November, November 3rd, it's all, it's all over, right? This is it. Oh, good God, who knows? <laughs> it's just nice to see some real live people here. I was chatting with April Snellings earlier saying, I, haven't, I don't think I've seen people in a couple of weeks. So this is all very exciting. I'll try and contain myself. <laughs> uh, who else do we have joining us? Oh, it's it's April Snellings. Well, hello. Hey, guys. Hi from Possum Holler. How are you? <laughs> good, good. Good. Great to hear your voice. How are you? Good to see you guys. I'm good. Things are, um, you know, things are, are moving along here. So, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm with Clay. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how things go. Mr. Sparadakis. Uh, yes, I'm hearing you. I'm there I'm now. I'm seeing you. Hello, everyone. Greetings. Hello, all. Nice to see you. A pleasure Good to see to it, you. John. Congratulations to the to Glary. Glary, our fearless leaders. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Hard on behalf to believe. Of thespians everywhere who have uh, have been given uh, opportunities to perform for the last ten years. Thank you. Uh, John, what titles have you been in? Actually, it'd be interesting. We could always cut to a clip or two if you uh, have something. Titles what? Of the tales? Yeah, what tales were you? Uh, well, we did uh, the first one, Man on the Ledge, right? The very first yeah. one. Then the live shows that Clay hosted. Uh, we I was in uh, Caper and, uh, of course, The Crush and uh, Stranger, Stranger, the UFO one. Oh, yeah. And uh, the uh, one that just uh, just aired, Dead Man's Shoes. Um, and then, of course, uh, a couple of, uh, Glenn, a couple of yours, the uh, Ripple at Cedar Lake. <laughs> a Fun couple one. of classic McQuaid's, the Ripple at Cedar Lake, right. as trilogy, well as Die Quaid, Sleeping My Sweet. The Quaid, that's right, all of those classics. And, uh, and uh, oh, I don't know, other ones that Little Monsters or what have you. You know, I know we have limited time. I have a suggestion for you gentlemen. I've been looking forward to this. I don't know if this will grab you or not, but I'm thinking in light of Halloween coming up and in light of our current ridiculous uh, political situation, I thought I might favor us with a, a brief reading of Edgar Allan Poe's Mask of the Red Death. Anybody up for that? Could we go How with brief. that? How brief. Well, it's, uh, it's the shortest of his Gothic uh, 
gothic tales. So uh, I'd love to read the uh, entire piece. I feel like it has a, a continuity. If, it, if, if you have an issue with, with that, I suppose I can just do snippets here and there. Well, maybe uh, since we have other guests, uh, maybe you could read a snippet, John, and give us a taste. I'll give you, I'll give you just a, uh, a brief taste, if you, if you will. I'll, but I'll, I'll read the opening section. But when I read this, uh, I would love you all to just think about the current occupant of the White House and think about the year we have been through. And keep in mind that this little story was written 170 years ago. The Mask of the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe. The Red Death had long devastated the country. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal, the redness and the horror of blood. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness and then profuse bleeding at the pores with dissolution. The scarlet stains upon the body and especially upon the face of the victim were the pest ban which shut him out from the aid and from the sympathy of his fellow men. And the whole seizure, progress, and termination of the disease were the incidents of half an hour. But the Prince Prospero was happy and dauntless and sagacious. When his dominions were half depopulated, he summoned to his presence a thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court and with these retired to the deep seclusion of one of his castellated abbeys. The abbey was amply provisioned. With such precautions, the courtiers might bid defiance to contagion. The external world could take care of itself. In the meantime, it was folly to grieve or to think. The prince had provided all the appliances of pleasure. There were buffoons, there were improvisatory, there were ballet dancers, there were musicians, there was beauty, there was wine. All these and security were within. Without was the Red Death. I mean, let me just Very say, if that's not genius, I mean, come on. Glenn, didn't you yourself write a, a tale that was at least partially inspired by our, our current political imbroglio um, and your mass exodus from our, our lovely country? Uh, reappraisal? Yeah. Is that what you're talking ah. about? Yeah, yeah, it is indeed. <laughs> and I have a quick, very funny little story about reappraisal involving John Sparadakis. I, I sent the tale to John in, in sort of a rough form and uh, he got back to me and said, that's great. That that old guy you got for it was fantastic. <laughs> and I assumed he, he was talking about Larry. <laughs> and I said, yeah, isn't Fessen and good in it? I, I just hadn't a clue. And I've listened to the damn thing again a number of times. And I know it's Larry. And I still can't. I still don't get it. It just, you know, it, it, the voice doesn't go with the mental image that I have. You're moving country. How did you know that? Well, none of the furniture belongs here, that's obvious, and I noticed the receipt for international movers on the kitchen counter, so I assume you've already packed your belongings and they are on their way to... Mm, Ireland. How did you know that? Well, your accent's faded, but I, I have an ear for such things. Do you speak Gaelic? Is Galatanga grammar? What a brilliant, what a brilliant story. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. Hey, and by the way, do we have someone else coming on, Larry, here? Hello, James. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Am I here? Hello, James. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Looking good. Well, great to be here. Uh, uh, great to have a little time to reminisce about tales. Uh, so I came into the kingdom through the Icelandic door, and that's where Larry and Glenn and I became colleagues and friends many years ago. How long ago was that? Last winter? Six? Yeah, when was that, John? Do you know? I can't remember. Look, I think that LeBro's beard is rivaled only by our next uh, companion. Uh, Graham, 
Welcome. Oh, you know, I actually, uh, Mr. Legro, I had a beard almost as long and luxurious as yours. Pretty close. I shaved it the first day of quarantine, and it's now like this is how much it's grown since then. Yeah, I shaved mine in Indicates. August, but you know. <laughs> um, you know, we are doing this as a podcast for uh, for listeners who may not know all of our history. Clay is responsible for bringing us to the uh, bringing tales to the stage in New York City. Uh, I believe it's because you were. Uh, about to have a child, isn't that right? And you realized you needed a substitute act for your regular show at Dixon Place in downtown Manhattan. And you offered it to Glenn and I, and we were suddenly confronted with the idea of doing the uh, tales, of which we've done one season in the studio, uh, doing them live. And so thank you for that. It set us on a great journey. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, I, I kind of think back to that really fondly, and that was a kind of a career career high point, um, you know, in this kind of silly, absurd, non-existent downtown black box theater existence. Um, you know, Dixon Place has a devil may care, throw it against the wall, see what sticks, programming mentality, and they they were so happy to just have something, something in the space and butts in seats. And, uh, but, you know, just, I, I remember the kind of the, the, the tension, the, the level of stress going into each night and how Glenn would be lying on the floor at some point, you know, kind of nursing an ulcer and Larry would be kind of running around trying to figure out uh, how to plug in cords to what, outlet or inlet and you know there just never seemed to be enough kind of uh extension cables or you know it it it, it, see, it had that kind of like hey guys let's put on a show mentality um and somehow miraculously it all paid off and now we have these sh shows to to kind of look look at or listen to and think back on fondly do you remember do you remember glenn server showed up about 45 seconds before we started that. Do you remember that? He was, I don't know if he, he had, he had a, another show that night or what? The he was on was. Broadway, yeah. I think and it was a just, home or something. Yeah, yeah I don't and know. he just yeah. got to us right before we started, we had to start the tale. Literally like a minute before he walked into the theater. Uh, I remember yeah. that ratcheted up the stress a little bit. <laughs> yeah, uh, similarly with, uh, with the crush, Sean Young arrived about two minutes before we got on stage and I had I had a precious little two minute chat with her before we get on and it's amazing though this is why we've been so lucky working with you know professionals because uh, they get up there and 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 just just fit into the shoes really quickly so I'm trying to remember what was the first show that we did at Dixon Place the first live Tales from Beyond the Pale show it was the Ram the Ram King wasn't it was it? Wow. Ambitious. You know, I, have, I have to say, Glenn, still to now, of all the 50 children, I think my favorite single, Larry knows this, my favorite single line reading uh, from the entire series is, is uh, Fessenden's immortal line in The Crush, I got something to say to you, Lottie, but you're not gonna like it. <laughs> <laughs> which, I, which I love. Which I, <laughs> I, like I can just song. listen to that line over and over. Uh, the the great thing about the crush, and it's the only time we did it, is uh, we had um, audience participation, where they had to provide the uh, evil chant to do away with the um, one of the characters, and they were all saying crush, crush, and we had a bouncing ball. Glenn requested that there be some sort of uh, bouncing ball behind, so the audience could still in there. What's happening? I've got something in mind for you now, Lottie. <laughs> but you're not gonna like it. Barton, help me! Murderer. Now to the fun part of the evening. Everyone, shoes off and grab hold of her. What's happening? It's time for the crush. The crush? No! Get your hands off of me! All of you! Get away! You should have listened to me, Lottie. I warned you! how I remember the performance at Dixon Place was 
this combination of anxiety about the technological aspects and then on the day of the fretting of who would actually show up to work. Remember Mark Margolis? I don't think he really believed that we were putting these on. And, and he the, Mark Margolis didn't realize it was a live show. That's what it was. <laughs> he showed up and thought it was a studio <laughs> and then realized pretty quickly we were, we were putting on a live show. Yeah. An audience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Graham, were you involved? Were you in the um... in the live shows? Yeah, I did. Uh, I was about to get married. I think at the end of that month, so I couldn't be too involved. But I did the live sound design for Dead Air oh. uh, with Johnny Rossini. That was Simon Barrett, and uh, yep. we had all done uh, "You're Next," and so I was a big fan of Simon. For the love of... Hello, Cam LX. If you're a prank caller, I'm gonna trace this call and have you arrested. How can I help you? Charles? Oh, what is going on there? James? Yeah, man. Where are you? I'm at home, dude. Oh. I, I thought you were still here in the building. <sighs> Why? I showed you how everything works. It was fun no, to do man, that. Yeah, we did, we did a whole sort of uh, I need to get some sleep. big soundscape mixing thing live with all sorts of different elements. And yeah, John Moros was, was doing some of it. I was doing some of it. And we had some live musicians too. I mean, it was a whole, whole rigmarole. Glenn, do you remember our fantastic live guys? I know Dave Egger himself, who's played on many Glass Eye movies. Uh, he's Joel Garland was in, uh, was in there too, uh, in the, the cast, wasn't he? He was yeah, uh, <clears throat> musician-wise, I think on the night we had Julian Maley on guitar, maybe. Yeah, that's great. Or, or, or no, he was on the Moog. Was he on a Moog or he's on a Terramin? Did we have it's gas. Tales yeah. from Beyond the Pale Live is insane. It's the closest I feel like I've ever been in, as to being in a, a punk band, you know? Like, no, I thought you were going to say to doing acid. <laughs> well, no, I've, I've done acid. <laughs> But would you say that that doing the live show, what season two was any different than doing the the road show versions? The the I, those to me seemed far more uh, chaotic, ramshackle, nerve nerve wracking because you would just have the show on your back and you'd have to essentially just drop it into whatever space they gave you. With season one, you know, we had to save you the studio. It was still new to us, so we were kind of freaking out. Season two, we had the uh, comfort of being in the one live space, uh, but you know we were just extending our sort of knowledge on how we put these things on live. And then with three going on the road, I feel like we're progressively making uh, life tougher for ourselves with the project in a way. But with Utah, I remember we got there, we arrived, uh, in the middle of the night, I think. So the next morning we met uh, April, yourself, myself, uh, Larry, Barbara Crampton, and um, Leon Vitale, um, of all people, uh, sat down and had a quick read. That was the first time the actors had read uh, Cold Reading. Um, as and, and Larry, I'm not even sure, <laughs> it was, was no signal written at that stage? <laughs> Were you feverishly writing it up in the hotel room? Well, the <laughs> point that was fun about that is that uh, we conceived fairly early on when you had this idea to do a seance uh, of doing, um, I thought, wouldn't it be cool to do a sequel the way they do in Hollywood, you know, years later. And yours was a period piece, so mine uh, was contemporary, as if they returned to the house, you know, uh, a century later with just a skeletal understanding of what had happened that fateful night. That, so I think as an evening, it must have been kind of fun because you were now familiar with the, the rules of the ghosts uh, and the backstory, and then mine was more contemporary. How to start, man? Huh? How to come to this? It was little things at first. Things I could hide. Bruises, mostly. He convinced me that I was driving him to it. So I stopped doing all the things that set him off. 
I stopped seeing my family. I stopped having friends. I stopped going out. Everything that made me me just faded away. I did what he told me to do. Spoke when he told me to speak. I put up with it because I knew if I left, you'll regret it if you ever try to leave. He told me. I believed him. And I think I would have lived the rest of my life like that if it hadn't been for Amelia. She was absolutely fantastic. And I remember when she uh, read the script, you know, things get pretty intense for, um, <laughs> for her. And uh, what did she tell us, Glenn, that she had to, had to lie down for, for a bit? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for, for the first time. She'd have a snack and lie down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> After the rehearsal, yeah, and she was so, just phenomenal. And that was your first. Was that your first experience with Tales from Beyond the Pale, April? Uh, that was that came after Food Chain, actually. So oh, yeah. okay. Wow, yeah, did it yeah. really? It did, wow. It did. Yeah, weird, right? Uh, <laughs> um, not long after. It was just a few months after we uh, recorded. Okay. It. To be clear, Food Chain is one of the classic tales. It's so bananas. And it really is very layered. There's quite a bit of um, nuance to this somewhat broad Betty story or Bigfoot story. I appreciate that. And it's interesting that you say that because I'm actually working with a filmmaker right now to uh, turn it into a movie. And one her, yeah, yeah. So that's my, and this is the first time that I've said that out loud. So we have a that's kind of a, a you know, yay. You're committed now, yeah. you're committed. I, I'm committed. A guy named Joseph O'Brien, who's a, a big uh, fan of tales, and uh, I, I think Glenn, you might have encountered him at some point through some uh, through Remorgue, maybe. But um, okay. so we're in the process of expanding this little 30-minute play into a 90-minute script, and there is just so much. We're having a blast with it, and um, it's just unfolding you know really really beautifully so i say that i'm particularly delighted because the funny thing is when we started this project and we were trying to entice filmmakers uh and writers but somehow filmmakers in particular to join us we always said don't you have a script in a drawer that uh, you never were able to make into a movie and um if you do a tale version of it the execs will listen because it'll be half an hour and digestible and then they'll make your movie and of course it never happened <laughs> finally it's happening hey uh, april who played the bigfoot in your audio drama it's an awesome performance yeah it is an irish actor uh oh, yeah. one, but a guy named I, glenn he was he was pretty spectacular yeah so, yeah he came with a dog wow. how cool would it be <laughs> if you got him to play the bigfoot in the movie <laughs> you know, I think we should. I think we need to get him in a Bigfoot suit, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! Oh, we gotta get back to the truck. I don't know what the fuck that thing is, but I'm not hanging around to find out. I was right. This shit is not worth a thousand bucks. Guys, we got to stick together. You can stick it up your ass, Terry. Christ, it's fast. It's over there! No, it's this way! Willie, watch where the fuck you're pointing that shotgun! Jesus Christ! Fuck, Willie, you fucking killed Ray! Uh, uh, I didn't mean to! It, it was an accident! Oh, oh, Christ! Just calm down, we're jumping to conclusions. Maybe he's alive. There is a big fucking hole where his face used to be. Explain to me how he's alive. We all gotta be cool. We can't panic. We just gotta, like, not lose our heads. <laughs> Oh, that is in-a-fucking-appropriate, Willie. Ray is dead. I didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. It's Terry's fault. How is it my goddamn fault that you shot Ray's face off? You're the one that brought us out here. You planned the whole thing. You're the one that has a fucking cooler full of monster feet. Oh, you're so fucking dramatic. There's only one foot in there. <laughs> hey, I, I had fun playing the Bigfoot in your audio drama. I can tell you did. You, you, uh, you sold it. There. <laughs> yeah, he's a sad Bigfoot. He was kind of mournful, I thought. Yeah, you know? Bezos, for sure. That's a yeah. wonderful actor. Yeah. There's nothing he can't do. If, if I could interrupt, um, I think, Glenn, it'd be a nice time to play one of our, speaking of imaginary creatures in the, in the woods, maybe we'll play one of our recent releases, uh, a little poem that Glenn and I prepared, two poems, 
for a, uh, a wonderful read-along that was put out by Holy Mountain Press. It's an absolutely delightful little vinyl um, treat. And it's sort of in the spirit both of the election and the Halloween season. As you can see, the, the cover is a classic. I don't know if you can see it. And the, the listener will have no idea, but I guess we'll post a picture. Anyway, let's have a listen uh, to Simon is Hiding. Simon is Hiding by Larry Fessenden. Simon is hiding. Where can he be? Is he under the tartufalo tree? No one is sure. No one can say. Some people think Simon has just run away. But I know that Simon is hiding quite near. You just have to look. Use your eyes and your ears. And don't say a word. You don't want to miss any clues that might tell you just where Simon is. You might wonder why Simon has disappeared. I wish I could tell you. I wish it was clear. But there's just no telling why Simon is gone. Is it because someone was mean and made him forlorn? Or does he have a secret he would rather not share? A secret too awful for people to bear. Some will tell you his face has no nose at all, that his head is a pumpkin and he stands eight feet tall. They say when he walks, you hear clickety-clack as his hoof feet and bone fingers brush forward and back. Do you know Simon means listen? And that's what you should do if you want to hear something that is totally new. Some say they've seen him roaming at night through the meadows and cornfields in the pale moonlight and in the back streets around this sleepy town, behind the old pharmacy and the inn that's run down, and the movie palace that's closed, and the ball field that's empty, because no one will play with each other. They think they're the enemy. Now you and I know that Simon doesn't exist any more than there's a tartufalo tree out there in the mist. But Simon is an idea that lives in our heart. And once he is gone, that can just be the start of something insidious and ugly and dark, turning neighbor on neighbor like fire from a spark. Because Simon's not evil. Simon's not bad. It's the absence of Simon that should make us feel mad. It's because Simon's hiding that we should all care. Let's bring him back and make him feel welcome. Otherwise, I dread to think what we've all become. If you, if you all are up for it, I'll, I'll read another little section, if I may, from, from Mask. Again, just, I, I, I picked this out just because of uh, the, in, the insane relevance uh, of, uh, of Poe's writing to our, our current moment. This sort of uh, continues the story. Just uh, close your eyes and think about, uh, think about the year we've been through. This is a short little paragraph. It was toward the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion 
and while the pestilence raged most furiously abroad, that the Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends at a masked ball of the most unusual magnificence. But in spite of these things, it was a gay and magnificent revel. The tastes of the Duke were peculiar. He had a fine eye for colors and effects. He disregarded the decora of mere fashion. His plans were bold and fiery, and his conceptions glowed with barbaric luster. There are some who would have thought him mad. His followers felt that he was not. It was necessary to hear and see and touch him to be sure that he was not. He had directed in great part the movable embellishments of the seven chambers upon occasion of the great fate, and it was his own guiding taste which had given character to the masqueraders. Be sure they were grotesque. His own guiding taste which had given character to the masqueraders. That's all I'm gonna say. Mm -hmm. I have uh, very fond memories of Angus Scrim, who is a dear friend of Glass oh. and Tales. Um, and he would go to these horror conventions, like the Fangoria Horror Convention, and they were showing, you know, gory films by Herschel Gordon Lewis and then whatever the flavor of the year was. And uh, they were wonderful, very warm events filled with gore and depravity. And Angus would get up, and people knew him especially as the uh, actor from Phantasm and all the sequels, James having been in one of them. But Angus would take the stage and he would read Poe, he would read The Raven, he would recite The Raven. So lucky that we got to work with Angus on Tales. He's in quite a few and uh, none more my favorite than probably The Grandfather. Hey, Pops. Hello there, James. Hey, Dad. And hello, Minnie. Kevin, honey, say hello to your grandfather. Hello. Why, hello there, Kevin. My gosh, you're growing up big and strong. Come over here. Give your grandfather a hug. Okay. <laughs> but don't be too rough. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the grandfather was, I think, the first tale that I did, and uh, he didn't know who I was. I wrote it for him. I just kind of crossed my fingers, got him on the phone, and he could not have been nicer or more encouraging. It's just the menchiest mensch, just absolutely the sweetest guy that I've ever met and continued, you know, for the rest of his life every time. I mean, he had a memory that was could defeat anyone. I mean, he, I remember Glenn at the I Sell the Dead screening in LA shortly before he passed, he sat up in front of the audience and he was talking about his violin teacher when he was like seven and remembered her name and all these details about her. It was like, and he was just like that. He was just a very kind and, and very generous guy. Well, as, yeah, as, as you all know, he wrote liner notes for a lot of classical albums as a, you know, as a gig. And he said yeah. Lawrence guy. the Beatles were going to go nowhere, <laughs> which he totally regretted and sort of apologized for. <laughs> um, guys, we are joined by none other than Sam Zimmerman, one of my favorite people on the planet, and also a, uh, a Tales... Uh, regular, having started as a film critic, uh, and probably something before that, but that's how I came to know Sam. Very supportive, wonderful uh, writer, able to find, um, you know, what's interesting about different types of movies. In other words, a true critic that invites you into the, the piece. But unfortunately, we lost him as a film critic, and now he works at Shudder. Uh, but we managed to snag him as a, a wonderful leading man in several tales. Hello, Sam. Hi. I'm so happy to see you guys. It makes me, my heart is so full. I miss you all. Good to see you, man. Looking uh, good, buddy. Looking good. Thank you. I've been working very hard on this mustache. Nice. <laughs> a lot of tender care. Looks good. Thank you. Yeah, I preferred your look in Psychopaths, but that that's a... That's uh, okay. I mean, I have the mask right here. I can just go get it. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, uh, Sa Sam, what was, what was the first tale that you joined us for? You were just like the, uh, the ambulance driver in the werewolf picture. The paramedic. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 
and we kind of threw you a bone. I don't know that you'd even started your uh, your career as a thespian yet, but we thought, well, we have to do that. You know? My distinguished career as a tailed thespian. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, paramedic, pilot, right? Oh, well, pilot's still my, my finest performance, thanks Def, to the Irish Def accent coaching. As, a, as from an Glenn. Irish pilot, that was very good. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, what's the thing called? The bullhorn did the heavy lifting. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 You just, you just, you said, speak like this, don't go high with the accent, and the bullhorn will do the rest. Good evening, folks. This is your first Captain Andrew Fleming. Looks like we're getting in Dublin Airport a little early than expected. Local time is currently 1.45 a.m. If you'd like to go ahead and say you're watching now. Then you're fantastic in um, uh, Barricade with Tony Todd. I thought it was really fun that you you took someone as accomplished as Tony Todd and, and just stuck him with me and Roxanne, two complete non-actors. <laughs> you made it. No thanks to you, Wilson. You can expect termination papers if we make it through this. Look, it's not in my job description to protect this station. You have a hammer and nails in this place. Hey, well, we're just going to leave, okay? We're going to get the hell away from all this. I wouldn't advise it. They're out there. Don't know what they are, but they're fast. And they're attacking anything that moves. Doesn't that just take the cake? Hammer and nails. Oh uh, yeah, I'll, I'll check in the basement. Maybe there's something down there. Or maybe in this drawer. Don't open that door. <laughs> <laughs> Still one of my favorite. Uh, <laughs> Graham, what else do you recall? You came to uh, Stanley at least once. Yeah, I mean, both times. Doing the Stanley, I think twice at the Stanley. We've done LA. We did LA together a couple times. I remember we all. Uh, it was at Cine, uh, well, the first one at Cine Family. Clay, were you there for that too? I feel like maybe. For the, what was it, the Spectre Fest? Yes. I, yeah, I think it was because we did the Bedbug one, right? Yeah, that yeah. was. Uh, yeah. I, had a yeah I remember going through all of it. But yeah, I'm, that was a lot of fun. And then, yeah, showing up to the theater and just like, just, it, it was just as fat, you know, it was fast and crazy and loose like the festival ones, but because it was LA and it wasn't like the, insular nature of a festival where everyone's there kind of it was just a little more sporadic and a little more hectic to me to some to some degree uh, but it yeah. all came together really beautifully and those were really fun fun to do they're fun pieces and i remember on the night we had about i feel i seem to think there was about seven synthesizers on stage <laughs> like it was yeah. just oh chrome canyon was there jamming. morgan Woolwich. yeah 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 he had well, a theremin i think i yeah. recall glenn i felt like we had three or four composers uh, all competing uh, for their sound space. Although the irony is that uh, the Graham won the day with the backbeat for uh, Vampire Party, which is still a classic uh, tale. Uh, yeah, that's a real sexy, disturbing, messed up bass <laughs> rhythm thing going on there. I love it. I love it. Thanks. Um, it uh, kicked off my career in electronic music. <laughs> Clay, you're very modest. The fact is, is that you set us up with Spectre Vision as well. So good on you, matey. Oh, I don't get, I don't, that's not me. You can't, I can't claim that. Yes, you can. Okay. Yeah, you're doing the boy, right? I did that. That's right. I did the boy. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah. Because I didn't know them until later. All right, we're going to give out Tails Awards, 10-year Tails Awards. And, uh, <laughs> Clay's going to get a very special one for uh, advancing the mission. And that's all. That's, that's all there is for that award. <laughs> Clay, that was your first time. Wait, what was the name of the award? I heard Inventing the Run Run Run. <laughs> inventing the Run Run Run. No, Advancing the Mission. Advancing the mission. Uh, you get a gold star. That's right. What's the award called? What are you calling the award? I just said it twice. <laughs> what do you call the award? It's called the Paley's. These, this is the Paley's, right? Nice work, Larry. Very nice, Larry. Very nice. Classic. It is classic. Very nice. Well, well done. Larry, I, when did, did, did we do a performance at Lincoln Center or, or did I just dream that? Uh, it, did. it was fantastic, and we had you and your son, Noah Legro, uh, and it was a very special event for me because it was a recollection of my friend who'd unfortunately been killed in a car accident 
with his son in the car. And also my son, Jack, played guitar on stage. So it speaks a lot about what Tales has been for Glenn and I as a way to immediately put something into production when it's very, very meaningful to us. Sometimes just an idea we have, a creative idea that it would take years to pitch to a studio to make a movie. But we're able to put this stuff um, on stage or at least into production. My friend had been killed. It's crazy when you look at this schedule. I mean, two weeks prior, and I wrote this in a fit of grief, and then we cast it, and it had this great poignance because it was father, son, you and Noah, uh, father, son, me, and Jack on stage. And um, I think Noah played music on that show too. Yeah, he did. Yeah, really a warm. Uh, experience very cathartic. Which one was that uh, paired with? Was that with that was paired with night? the classic Game Night? The game Night, which we which by I, Glenn we McQuaid. Heard, yeah. <laughs> which 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 has yet to be released. Actually, um, it's it's been gathering a little bit of dust. Um, needs needs a little fine tuning, I would imagine, but I'm sure we'll we'll get it out pretty soon. Yeah. I remember uh, getting on stage with all the actors. Uh, it was Larry, John, James, um, someone else, <laughs> Matt Huffman, everyone. And I just kept on saying my main direction was speed it up, speed it up. Because <laughs> it was such a long script. It was like 45 pages. <laughs> it was just like, so. And anyway. that's, that's another one, Glenn, that uh, Lauren Ashley Carter was in too. Uh, was in Game Night. Uh, Lauren's fantastic in Game Night because at one stage she's playing two characters and those two characters are sparring off at one another and she's spitfire about it. She's a fabulous actress. Love her. I thought Lauren would join us. I'm sad she doesn't seem to be here, but I'm also nervous that I'm such a bad host that I don't well, know how Zoom works. Let me quickly email. I, was, I waited in the waiting room about three separate times to try and get your attention. <laughs> I apologize. I uh, don't. I knew. I knew what was happening. <laughs> you knew. <laughs> which um, I hate to be the guy who leaves the party early, but uh, I'm gonna. I have to slip off to a five-year-old's birthday party downstairs. Oh. Um, wear a mask. It's it's a pleasure to see you all. Happy um, birthday, Clay. Wear a mask. Thank you. And pants. Um, Good to see you, Clay. <laughs> happy, happy birthday, Tails. Um, it's been a lovely 10 years. Thank you. Good to see you, Clay. Take care, guys. Clay. Stay safe out there. Clay's, Clay's going to miss my final rendition of The Mask of the Red Death. Well, that's well, why he can he in. download the podcast, John. Ah, of course. Um, Thank you, James. Well, you know, we were going to read, uh, we were going to play another uh, fantastic short. The town that's not there by Glenn McQuaid, a lovely story about the power of drama. Okay. I couldn't hear you. <laughs> I can't hear you. Couldn't hear a word of what, Larry. Is there something going on with your microphone? I don't know. Has that been true this whole time? I've said well, some just No, you just went down real low. Oh. The well, town that wasn't there. We got that far. And then so. suddenly you weren't there. Well, there you go. That's the that could work. Um, what's the... I mean, so I'm going to play... Uh, I'm going to take this opportunity um, to play the town that wasn't there. Uh, one of our wonderful short pieces uh, that Glenn wrote. The Town That's Not There by Glenn McQuaid. There is a town never quite there. No matter how hard you might look or stare, it's a secret, you see, or rather, you'll hear. It's a town you'll find only by using your ear. So where is this place so out of sight? Just open your mind and shut your eyes tight. 
What's that you hear? Nothing you say? But the branches above begin to sway. Listen hard now and you'll hear the breeze that whistles about these invisible trees. And under the trees, a babbling brook with fish aplenty unless you know. Over the river, a bridge white with snow, and on it stands someone with somewhere to go. Briskly he walks the night walk home, his quick steps heard but never shown. His face you'll not see, nor suit, shoes, or hair, for he belongs to the town that's not really. About him are birds of plumage unknown. Dog things and cat things, but not like from home. Insects and outsects fly all around, made all the stranger by being but sound. From behind this homeward bound inhabitant creeps something really quite extravagant, a creature that defies explanation. But just take a listen to the roar of this creation. Our man now in a mad dash, but it's too late. Do you hear that? The beast is on him, enjoying the supper of the poor man and his fine uproar. What is the owner of this magnificent growl? The full moon a clue, as is the howl. It's a werewolf, you see, or rather you hear. In the town with no image, they all walk in fear. Down comes the rain to wash away the blood, and soon the river rises into a flood. And with the storm brewing, the sound of wings, belonging, no doubt, to hideous things. How does one enter this unusual? With peculiar delights, dangers abound. There's no border or passport control, no documents needed, tax fee or toll. All are welcome, and to all that would stay, just close your eyes tight and keep them that way. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice, Glenn. Was that a real werewolf recording? It was actually um, my doggy. I believe, uh, who's I also, <laughs> hey. who's also in um, Stuart Gordon's and uh, H.P. Lovecraft's The Hound. I recorded him chomping on some bones for, for a death scene in that. But let's be very clear, I play The Hound. <laughs> yes, but you know, Alfred was your Foley artist. <laughs> Alfred helped out on food chain as well, I think. I think some of the uh, the bone Have crunching you, was courtesy yeah. of Alfie. Yeah. He's you always me it's the same. Yeah. I think, I think Alfred actually played the old guy in reappraisal as well. I, I, <laughs> I, I think. I, uh, were you going to try to uh, shove in one more co reading, John? Oh, I would love to. I would love to bring this baby on home. Uh, let me just uh, wrap up the tale. I'll, I'll just take little snippets from it. But uh, yeah, you, you just give this a listen and uh, let the language wash over you. This is the end of Edgar Allan Poe's Mask of the Red Death. 
When the eyes of Prince Prospero fell upon this spectral image, which with a slow and solemn movement, as if more fully to sustain its role, stalked to and fro among the waltzers, he was seen to be convulsed in the first moment with a strong shudder, either of terror or distaste, but in the next, his brow reddened with rage. Who dares, he demanded hoarsely of the courtiers who stood near him, who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him and unmask him, that we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements. It was in the eastern or blue chamber in which stood the Prince Prospero as he uttered these words. They rang throughout the seven rooms loudly and clearly, for the Prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. It was then, however, that the Prince Prospero, maddening with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers, while none followed him on account of a deadly terror that had seized upon all. And now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revelers in the blood-bedewed halls of their revel, and died each in the despairing posture of his fall. And the life of the ebony clock went out with that of the last of the gay, and the flames of the tripods expired, and darkness and decay and the red death held illimitable dominion over all. Wow. Whew. Yeah. They don't write them like that anymore. <laughs> well, tell that to Cormac McCarthy. <laughs> Different set of vocabulary, too. Beautiful. That was beautiful. That was Thanks a little... for reading that. Thanks for bringing that to the party. That's fantastic. I just want to emphasize again, a 170 year old piece of writing that sounded like it was written a month ago. I mean, uh, the man had his finger on the pulse and in the veins of this nation and uh, we're grateful. That's all I got to say about it. Well, thank you, John. That's, um, I'd like to just visit with everybody one more time, but we are winding down. Uh, Graham, are you still with us? I'm right here. What do you have going on? Do you want to promote anything? You have lots of music coming out. Yeah, I've got. Uh, I've been doing stuff every Bandcamp Friday, just bringing stuff out from the archives, including Melon Baller, the track from uh, from the, uh, the Tales Live that you mentioned before. Um, pulled that out of the archive because that's never been released, so that's going up on. My band that's up on the band camp. Um, and then, yeah, just working on a lot of stuff, but I, not a lot to talk about, you know, as usual, yeah. how it goes. Damn, we didn't spend too much time with you, but I noticed you've adjusted your lighting. I lit a candle the second the reading started. Ah. Oh, nice touch. I felt it was important. Yeah. I haven't gotten a, a pumpkin yet. I'm going to walk up the block tonight and carve. Oh, fantastic. And, um, I was wondering, do you have any movie recommendations? Since people can stream, I guess, you could recommend almost anything and we might be able to find it. Is there anything fun out there that's inspired you for this season? There's so much fun out there. Well, I think if you're subscribing to Shudder, you can watch The Incredible Dead Wax by Mr. Graham Resnick. Ooh. A brilliant little series about a vinyl which may or may not murder you. Or you can watch Tom Return of the Yes, exactly. Or you can watch Return of the Gulag, an ambient streaming jack-o'-lantern by one Mr. Larry Fessenden. Oh, wow. I hadn't thought that we'd all get such great promos out of this. <laughs> uh, I mean, you've made very special contributions to Shutter. I that do want to say fantastic. that I still think about when Tails was live. Was it at Under St. Mark's? Uh, probably Pixie Place. Is that what you're thinking of? Which one? Dixon Place. It was. Um, yes, at Dixon Place. Oh man, that was still my favorite. Uh, wasn't the Crush there? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so good. The Crush ripped. 
and when Dead Air was performed live, that was one of that was I remember so specifically feeling scared. Oh, so good. Yeah, Tells, that you mentioned it because we have talked about both of those, and I do feel they're classics. Um, I also am very fond of Caper, which we have two of the actors here. Uh, I love Caper, mostly because yeah. of the Halloween setting. And there's check a the box. Check the box. <laughs> yeah. now, Mark, Mark Margulis, if you've ever heard him say those words, you can never, you can never hear, can hear it. those words again without hearing him say. <laughs> Yes. Look, just give me the money and you won't see me again. Oh, I think you want to know what's in the box. It's pretty heavy. It can't be a couple of diamonds. No, no, not gems, but precious just the same. Kind of has the weight of a small child, don't you think? Fold it up in there. Look, I'm not, I'm not playing games with you, Bates, you sick fuck. Just give me the money. We did our end of the deal. I bought the damn box. You might want to call home, Spitz. Make sure everything is okay with the wife and the kid. Yeah. What are you? What are you talking about? What are you saying? What's in there? Ah, oh, go on and see for yourself. You've gone through so much trouble to bring it to me. <laughs> Are you paying or what? Where is the money? Check the box. Are you crazy? Check the box. Are you nuts? Check the box. I'll kill you, old man. You hear me? I'm gonna kill you. Shouldn't you get that? It could be your wife. Maybe she has some news. Caper is very special and shares a similarity to something like Relic that I love, which is the geography of something changing before you within a house yes. and it utterly warping your sense of time and space. And that's what's very scary to me. And I love that. And I do believe probably the Relic uh, writer and certainly myself owe a debt to uh, House of Leeds, one of the most extraordinary mm. works uh, in any medium. And that is a uh, fantastic book. I briefly tried to get the rights to make the movie and the guy to his credit said, I don't, I don't want it uh, adapted, which I thought huh. was cool. House of Leaves, folks. Now there's a novel to uh, read during the next uh, <laughs> quarantine because it's, it's extremely <laughs> immersive and completely bananas. The ongoing quarantine. Yeah. James, what do you have to tell us? Anything special? Good looking at it, Larry. I'm just hole up here in Guadalajara trying to finish this gig. I get in the van, I put on a clown suit, and I try and dance the steps. <laughs> I like it. Very nice. Well, that's the actor's lot. This is our 10-year anniversary, and... Um, we're running out of tales to present on the podcast, but we do want to continue the mission and uh, we want to do it with all you guys. Well, I do want to say that it's just been such um, a privilege to, to be involved with, with everybody to, you know, even, even the, the, the folks that I haven't worked with in, in any way, I'm just very proud to, uh, to be associated with, with the same project as all of you. I feel like we should be singing some sort of, anniversary song but we're going to spare the uh listener thanks everybody for being here thanks for for being a part of tales from beyond the pale um it's wild that it's 10 years old now um i'm glad that we've been able to keep it rolling and um it's definitely helped me as a, a writer and as a director to to be able to fine tune my craft in between movies and so yeah i love it thank you daddy Larry, I love you lots. Love you, Glenn. So long, gang. I think that's au revoir. it. Au revoir. Au revoir. Bye, all. Happy Halloween. Thank you, Larry. Happy Halloween. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Happy Till we meet awesome. again. See you, Graham. James, great to see you. April, love you. John, love you, Glenn. Larry, Bye. see you guys. Bless you all, my friends. Bye. Bye. Copyright 
2020 tale.